welcome to Channels Business Globe with me, Juliana Olayinka from Davos, where I have been all week covering the 54th annual gathering of the World Economic Forum. Coming up on today's show. We do not come to Davos with a big mouth. No. We are here on the pedestal of equality. We are here to talk to the first people. Uh, we are the largest country in Africa. We do have um, an important role to play and so we're here to make our voices heard and to also um, tell our own story. If we don't turn up uh, in, you know, at some of these platforms, uh, there's absolutely no way we're going to represent the interests of our people. And there's absolutely no way we're going to be able to attract the right resources to help us get to where we need to be. You know, Nigeria represents Africa. It's the most populous nation in Africa. It has its largest economy. And the trajectory of global growth is facing Africa, and Nigeria will make or mar that transition. So we have to be in Gabos to sell the Nigerian brand. Because wherever Nigeria goes, that's where Africa goes. I appreciate, I applaud, I celebrate the success stories of Botswana, of Mauritius, and even of Rwanda. But when you look at the size, what is the population of Botswana? 2.6 million people. What is the population of Mauritius? 1,300,557 people. Even Rwanda has a population of 14.9 million people. All pews, they are not bigger than metropolitan Kano. So the performance of Nigeria is absolutely essential. We are caught at an intersection of shifting geopolitical dynamics, of the complexities of recurring supply chains, and of course, the complexities, the demands of changing international trade and energy transition. So with President Bola Ahmed Tinubu at the helm of affairs, and firing on all cylinders, we have never had it so good in terms of governance. And I, he mandated me, go and sell the Nigerian dream, and I'm here to showcase Nigeria to the world. A new Nigeria, a pro-business, pro-investment Nigeria that is ready to open up, that is willing to embrace global-based practices, that is willing to observe the rule of law, the sanctity of contracts, sustain policy framework. I will really invite our international partners to come and invest in Nigeria, create jobs. I'm here as a merchant of hope, representing Nigeria and by extension the African continent. One out of every four Africans is a Nigerian. And by 2050, Nigeria will suffer the United States, will be the third most populous nation on earth, with a population of 400 and 40 million people. And by the end of the century, it is projected that Nigeria will be the most populous nation on earth. There is beauty in numbers. Yes, I am a realist, but I am also an eternal optimist. We can transform the anticipated demographic bulge into demographic dividends instead of the demographic disasters that the apologies of Thomas Malthus are saying that it will consume all of us. All we need to do is to wear our thinking caps, come up with robust programs, because the trajectory of global growth is facing Africa. And Nigeria will make or mar that transition. Wherever Nigeria goes, that's where Africa goes. So this is why I'm not afraid of tomorrow. Our population is young. The average age of the Nigerian nation is 19. 
So we can harness this potential. Yesterday, it was in the news that China is aging. Their population declined by 2 million. The Asian tigers are aging. Europe is aging. But Nigeria is a young nation. And by 2035, it is projected by Conperi, the global finance uh, consultancy outfit, that there will be 65 million global talent deficit in the world. The United States, Russia, and Brazil will suffer from 6 million uh, deficit. Even India, the global powerhouse of our sourcing, will only have 1 million surplus with our young population, with our proficiency in English. There are more English speakers in Nigeria than in India. Our proximity to Europe is now 125 in Davos. It's exactly 125 in Abuja and Lagos. And most importantly, even our accent. I'm not a racist, but you and I know that we have better accent of the English language than the Indian. And in this year alone, India is projected to earn $100 billion from outsourcing alone. And how much did we ever earn from crude oil? The highest we had ever got, gotten was $35 billion in 2011 when President Goodluck Ebele Jonathan was at the helm of, at the helm of appears when oil was hovering in the neighborhood of $150 per barrel. So opportunities abound to diversify our economy. And this is precisely what President Bola Ahmed Tinubu is vigorously, conscientiously committed towards exploring. And in the fullness of time, Nigerians will come to appreciate this poor man. Um, I've been to some events on the sidelines. Some of them do still see Africa as a charity case. What is your perception of us on the global stage? You know, since the advent of slave trade in the 1400s, about 600 years ago, and subsequently of colonialism from 1652 onwards, our relationship with the West, and even when we go down memory lane with the East, has been that of a master-servant relationship, that of extraction. But when you look at the trajectory of the industrializing nations of Southeast Asia and even of Europe, the export of manufactured goods and of knowledge-based knowledge -based intangibles have really led to the flourishing of those economies because of increased value addition and accumulation. So I want to follow suit. We did not come to Davos with a begging bowl, no. We are here on a pedestal of equality. We are here to talk to them as equals. We want to enter into mutually beneficial relationship with Europe with the Americas, with the world. Because as I said the last time, we carry our poverty with dignity, but the world has become a global hamlet. We should have the interests of each other at heart for peace and stability and progress of the world. This is why I'm very comfortable in my skin. I don't see it as an all male, all white appear. I see it as an appear of a common humanity, all geared towards stability, peace, and progress. Because what binds us as members of the human race, of the human family, surpasses whatever that divides us. At the launch yesterday, some of the major speakers were Dr. Gabriel Sima, the Ethiopian head of the World Health Organization, Ngoji Okonjo Iwele, Ajay Banga, the World Bank president, these are not all, these are not white people. The foreign minister 
of Saudi Arabia is certainly brown but not white. So it's a mix of colors. It's a kaleidoscope of colors that represents the whole of humanity. But I don't want to be pigeonholed into a particular race or region. I believe that the African representatives are on top of their game, are as competent as the American or the European. So I'm very comfortable in my skin and be rest assured they will go back home a much more accomplished people because at the Nigeria dialogue session, we had very fruitful cross-pollination of ideas with some of the leading lights of industry in Europe and Americas, and it will translate into bountiful habits for the Nigerian nation and by extension, Africa. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Well, to me, right now, it kind of feels like a, when you're in a well, we're here this week, uh, led by His Excellency, the Vice President, Kashim Chetima, um, leading the Nigerian delegation to this all-important uh, dialogue. We have made it a point to be part of the conversation, to be in the room all around the world this year, from the Paris uh, Financing Summit all the way through to, of course, ONGA and COP28, not forgetting the World Bank annual meetings. Davos is an important uh, uh, dialogue uh, um, that takes place every year, 50 heads of state, several hundred uh, ministers, of course, about a thousand companies, and um, they're here to talk about the global challenges, security, cooperation, um, growth, jobs. And I think the important topics of the day now are climate change and um, more and more generative AI, or AI, artificial intelligence in particular. And it's important that we as Nigerians are here. Uh, we are the largest country in Africa. We do have um, an important role to play. And so we're here to make our voices heard and to also um, tell our own story, our own story of progress, our own story of uh, uh, making Nigeria an investment destination. Well, I, I think in all, it's a whole package of reforms. It's not one ad hoc message or one ad hoc measure here and there. It's a whole package of reforms, of course, set off, ignited and, and, and um, launched by Mr. President's um, uh, historic uh, measures he made once he came into office. As we know, he remo removes subsidy. He reformed the exchange rate market and that laid the basis of several other reforms that, that have taken place since uh, um, there is an attempt to increase revenue, reduce debt, reduce debt service, uh, increase capital expenditure and as you know reduce the cost of governance and um, I think it's important also to say that we know that the measures taken since May 29 have requ have required patience, have caused pain have caused um, the usual adjustment uh, uh, um, difficulties and that has meant a rise in the cost of living for the average Nigerian. But I think Mr. President has also showed empathy. He has intervened on behalf of the poorest, on behalf of farmers. And in addition to showing to putting in place the right policies, difficult as they may be, he has also shown empathy. He has looked to uh, support the poorest and the weakest and most vulnerable and importantly, he's now beginning to show the extent to which he's willing to lead by example. He has cut the cost of his own trips, the cost of governance, uh, um, by 60% in terms of his own entourage. And I think that's an important signaling which will be built on. Coming up after the break. I believe Nigeria is where to go. And uh, sooner or later, with events like these, uh, the messages will trickle down. We don't need aid, we don't need grants. We want investment. All of this and more. Do stay with us. Welcome back to Channels Business Globe with me, Juliana Olayinga, here in Davos, where I have been all week covering the 54th annual gathering of the World Economic Forum. I think as a nation, what we need to do is ensure we're prepared and we're part of the conversations on how we govern AI. Uh, the reason why 
people are worried about AI is because of the enormous opportunities that we get from it to fix a lot of problems. Uh, the ability to use uh, machines to help us do things that we've not been able to do before. The ability to put intelligence to fantastic use to solve some of our problems. I think for countries in Africa, actually more so, uh, because we do have a lot of societal business issues that we're trying to quickly accelerate and fix, there's no better way to fix them than leveraging artificial intelligence. So I think as a nation, what we've been doing is ensuring that we get our strategy right. Uh, so we are rebuilding the AI strategy for the country, but at the same time also deepening the talent pool. If we don't have the local workforce to help us put it to good use, we'll struggle. But not only that, leveraging the Nigerian diaspora as well to ensure that we can use them to help us make gains out of the AI. Uh, you know, people should actually be more factual and use evidence in, in some of this conversation. I've been places as well, when we went to Onga, there's a big news that came out of Onga, personally for me, but for the nation as well, that it's going to be out in a couple of weeks. If we don't turn up uh, in, you know, at some of these platforms, uh, there's absolutely no way we're going to represent the interest of our people. And there's absolutely no way we're going to be able to attract the right resources to help us get to where we need to be. And the president is extremely intentional about that. It's about value. It's about creating value. Partnerships that can help us solve significant problems. When I was going to Anga, I put out a note on what I was hoping to achieve. I'm looking forward to that relationship where people actually question and ask if those things were achieved or not. I'm here. I put out a note on some of the things I'm, I'm looking forward to, to getting done. I hope people will start to ask questions based on evidence, not just emotions. And I understand why the emotions may be there. But for us to get to where we need to be, we must have meaningful conversations. Yes, I don't think that, you know, um, the West needs to tell us, you know, what to do. Yes, we have, you know, signed up to all the protocols, you know, global protocols on, you know, climate change. We've actually taken steps you know, a lot further than most countries even in the West, with the passage of you know, a bill on climate change. We now have a full directory, full commission on climate change. Well, the point has to be made, I wish you know, you um, clearly captured that you know, Britain, you know, gave several licenses you know, for exploration in the North Sea, which means first of all, we don't go away soon. If you look at history, no source of energy has been completely eliminated from coal to None has been completely eliminated. But for us, you know, as Africa, if you look at emissions, the total emissions, you know, from Africa is only about 3%. So actually, well, they shouldn't be talking to us about emissions because we contribute only 3%. But what is important is that most of the investment that, you know, we need come from the West because we don't have the money to be able to invest in exploring, in exploring our, you know, our oil and gas resources. But Africa is also rising up. And we're saying that, look, let's have an African energy bank that will be able to provide the funding that we need to be able to, you know, fund oil and gas investment in Africa. African Development Bank is there. There are so many investors from Japan to, you know, the U.S. There are investors. We want to create a similar bank so that whereas the West has used fossil fuel with all the accruals to be able to develop industrially, we are still trying to see how we can use fossil fuel to be able to raise the necessary funding to be able to transit peacefully. But the point must be made that we contribute only 3%. So they shouldn't be preaching to us. If today, if the West, if America says, look, we want to stop fossil fuel exploration, it will be a good sign. But the US will never make a statement to say that we're stopping it. And a good example is that the UK, just as I said, gave licenses for exploration. So is it in our best strategic interest for us to stop no. Very soon we're going to be doing a new bid round. We were saying that, look, come to Nigeria, invest. The new PIA gives you the best of fiscals you can get anywhere in the world, you know, where you have 50% rebate. And I believe that, you know, we need those investments. But I also want to use the opportunity to call on Nigerians in the diaspora. They say, look, whereas countries, you know, are talking about cleaner and greener energy, you Nigerians who are in the diaspora, who have the means to be able to come and invest, either in the upstream, in the midstream, in the downstream, should come and invest. It's a huge opportunity. You know, yesterday we, 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 we heard in the news that, you know, there's a consortium of five Nigerian 
indigenous companies that are bottled by Shell, onshore, you know, investment. It's a good one. It could have been bought by a company that's from outside Nigeria, but mm -hmm. a consortium of companies came together. Okay. They pulled money, you know, together to make those investments. It will come to me, you know, as minister that the president in his own wisdom has bestowed, you know, with authority to be able to give ministry a consent. We will encourage investors. Yeah. And any, you know, issues around the you know oil and gas industry, we are doing whatever we can to be able to make it as liberal as possible so that investors could come, invest, create jobs, so that from the jobs we can create, you know, we can create, we can work, we can work. We, we'll be able to raise the funding, we'll be able to get money from taxes. If we give you 50% of a bid, when you invest in the cost of, you know, the, you doing the expenditure, the exploration, you will employ people, those guys will pay taxes. So at the end of the day, I believe that Nigeria, you know, will have a new page in a global history of oil exploration by attracting the best conditions of investment, you know, for those who are in the sector. With our cassava, cocoa, rice value chain. Yes, actually, um, like you've said, we are thousands of miles away, but I think it's it's worth the trouble because uh, a lot of deals have been cut today. Cross University happens to be very lucky to have some, and um, the Renaissance, the organization of the African workforce and our potentials. It's coming into a real, real, what I would say, it's coming tops in some of the things that we're doing. So I believe that this is going to add very serious value to Africa, definitely. Across the state, um, it's been known for, we've known, been known for agriculture for quite a long time. We've recently added tourism. We have some very fantastic location sites uh, uh, for people to come and visit. And in terms of agri, we want to upscale agri. We are moving into a complete agri revolution. That's why some of the deals we signed here today are particularly about the agri sector. So we are doing all we can to make sure that uh, uh, Cross River State remains not just the agri hub, but the green hub also uh, for the whole of West Africa. But for those who have come to Nigeria, the perception has changed completely. They know that it's a safe haven because we can't compare. Uh, the level of crimes in places like Baltimore, as mentioned, and the rest of it with Nigeria. You cannot in any way uh, compare it. And um, in terms of workforce, and then even uh, cost of labor, I believe Nigeria is where to go. And uh, sooner or later, with events like these, uh, the messages will trickle down, and the rest will join the queue. Well, sadly, that's all we have time for today, but do get in touch with your comments and suggestions. I'll see you at the same time next week in London for more in-depth business analysis on Channels Business Global. Goodbye.